Autocross is a sport where just one seemingly tiny mistake can cost you a championship. You're talking about championships that are won by hundreds of a second. How do you quantify that? What do you look for? It isn't just fixing a corner, it's, it's micro-fixing. Welcome to What Moves You, a Speedway Motors podcast telling the stories behind the cars and the people who build and drive them. I'm Joe McCullough, and in this episode, Mary Posey talks about what it took to go from borrowing a boyfriend's Camaro and autocrossing it without telling him, to building her own race cars and winning a dozen national autocross titles. From humble beginnings to national titles and even appearing in a Gran Turismo video game, Mary Posey talks to us about her lifetime of racing. How did this all start for you? I mean, were you always into cars and then the racing came second or did the racing sort of start at all and the cars followed? Wow, this, 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 this question alone could probably take about an hour. Um, but in, in, in uh, the Cliff, Cliff Notes version of it is uh, I've always been kind of a car nut. Uh, three of the four parents, I came from two divorced families. Three of the four parents were physicians. And I originally had thought I would follow in their footsteps. And uh, so on a whim, one summer, I ended up taking an auto shop class and I fell in love with it. It was really fun. I had a great instructor. He was actually a mentor to me in many respects uh, in my career further on down the line and also starting out. But I'd always been attracted to fun cars, this and that. Uh, my, my father had some neat stuff when I was growing up. Um, as far as autocross went, uh, you know, we all have aspirations when we're growing up. If we have any kind of octane in our veins that we want to be a race driver. We see the Unsers, we see AJ Foyt, we see the Andrettis and we go, you know, I have a dream and I want to do that. Well, unfortunately, a lot of things, this big thing called money kind of mm -hmm. says, uh, sorry, you know, not going to happen for you. Mm -hmm. Well, back in 74, 75, uh, I moved up to the Monterey Peninsula and I got wind that there was a local event out at the local airport and you get to drive your car around, around cones and make up a course and you get to go out there and have some fun and it's timed and, you know, yeehaw. So mm -hmm. I borrowed my then boyfriend's car, didn't tell him what was going on. <laughs> and I found out it was a driver school. And so I went out there and ironically, uh, they put me with the guy that had a Camaro. Uh, he had a 67. I think I was driving, gosh, what was it? 74, 75. First of the, um, of the uh, big bumper, the rubber bumpers. And so, um, yeah, they said, well, why don't you help her? She's got a Camaro and, and this would be a great thing. So that's kind of how I got started into it. And I had a Mercury Capri at the time and kind of took that out a little bit this and that uh it was fun you know i had no idea what i was doing ran it on street tires which back then were you know kind of hard as rocks right and uh it was kind of neat it was kind of neat that was back i think in 75. do you remember your very first run around the cones i do how did that i go? do well, I wasn't timid. I can remember that far. <laughs> and I remember thinking, you know, this is actually a lot of fun. Unfortunately, I had no idea about traction limits. I had no idea about the things that we consider uh, golden today, such as grip and tire adhesion and suspension, alignment, all the things that make a car do the wonderful things that they do. Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't, that wasn't even part of it back, back in that day. I mean, the way that guys and gals, uh, strengthened suspension, honest to God, they would sit there and take nails and pound them into the, in, into the rubber bushings to make them stiffer. Hmm. Uh, it's kind of a weird thing because we did what we had to do. But, uh, you know, back then I, I do remember the first run and I remember it was kind of a course, maybe about 35 seconds long. We got a, a practice lap and then we got two flying laps. And that's how they used to do autocross back in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s was it wasn't where you start on the clock and you end somewhere else. Now it was kind of like three laps. Oh, okay. So we did that twice. And I remember, oh gosh, I was, I don't know, maybe a second and a half slower than a lot of the other fast guys and everything. And I thought, well, that, that, that's achievable. And that's kind of started everything. Mm -hmm. And that was in the Camaro that you had borrowed 
from your boyfriend without telling no, you? No, this was in my, uh, yes, yes. That was in the Camaro that I had borrowed. But then of course, when he got the car back and he says, wait a minute, I had more tread on the car when I gave it to you than it has now. That kind of stopped. So I kind of resorted back to the little two liter Capri and um, kind of continued a little bit with that. I then bought a Datsun 240Z. And that pretty much started the autocrossing in earnest. The car was taken off the street eventually and made into a full-fledged, A-prepared autocross car, uh, which was really fun. It had a Datsun uh, 280Z engine in it, uh, weighed about 1,800, 1,900 pounds. Um, It basically made the jump from street car to race car within about three years. And we trailered it everywhere, won a couple of national titles in the car back in 80 and 81, I believe, and then um, got a divorce. I ended up having to sell the car and things kind of continued from there. And how many national championships have you won all total? Officially, it's been 11. The 12th was back in 2015. And that was in a, I'm going to call it an experimental class, which was CAM. Mm -hmm. Uh, SECA felt that there was a need for our muscle cars that people have done suspension work, engine work, drivetrain work, all that other good stuff. And they've run them at good guys. And they thought we can capture this audience. And so that was the second year of the classic American muscle class as we knew it. And we know Mm -hmm. it now. And uh, so I've won a championship there as well. That kind of brings it maybe 11 and a half, 12. (laughs) And that's not an easy thing to do. You know, SCCA solo autocross is a very, very competitive form of racing. I mean, talk about very much so how that feels to go. I mean, for one thing, to go from kind of zero, never having done it before, driving around the parking lot in a Mercury Capri to national champion in a fairly short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Talk about the amount of work and dedication that that takes to get there. Well, Back when I started, the weird thing about this is that um, you got to remember back then I, I, I was making, I think, $1,200 a month. And I think my house mortgage was nine eighty. dollars So mm-hmm. I had very little bit of spare income to devote to racing, uh, autocrossing, you know, solo. And so what I would do is I would work on cars in my spare time. I worked at an auto parts store. I managed the auto parts store, which was kind of neat. I had a great, great owner and uh, we would get customers that would come in and I would do valve adjustments and I would do tune-ups and, you know, basic service work on their cars. We rebuilt a few engines uh, in, in in, in the back shed and that gave me money to be able to campaign the Z and also outfit it with the tires and equipment that we needed to. Uh, we made a lot of the things that we ended up using on that car, uh, my then husband and myself. And mm-hmm. like any of the other outlets to go ahead and, oh, I'm going to buy this and bingo, it shows up. It didn't happen that way. You had to basically create it back in those days. Right. So um, trying to think, yeah, it was a lot harder. And also one more thing, back then, the level of competition was not like it is today. Solo is probably one of the only automotive uh, competitive sports where we do run parallel ladies classes. We wanted to give the gals a chance to run. We wanted to give them a chance to come out with their husbands, their significant others, and actually find a niche where they could compete. A lot of gals back in the day, they really questioned having to run against, against the guys. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that? I mean, you're uh, obviously a lot of people consider auto racing to be kind of a man's game and you have been dominant for a long time uh what Mm -hmm. what do you say to people who who i mean has that ever um i mean were you ever treated differently i don't think so um i how i look at it and i've actually shared this on other uh interviews that i've done car has no clue if you have testicles or ovaries (laughs) all it knows is is it being presented to a corner well Can it get around the corner? Are you looking at the limits of what that car can provide to you and working on those limits and actually driving it up to those limits with it just flirting a little bit over? I've always been brought up with that. If somebody else can do it, there's no reason why I can't. And it's one of the things where cars, you know, cars, cars react to input. Um, You know, a car standing still is basically just a lump. 
Mm -hmm. So if you can go ahead and drive that car properly and give it what it needs to receive to get around a corner or get through an autocross course or drive down the freeway properly, it's going to reward you. So along those lines, what goes through your mind before a run when you're sitting there and the flag's about to drop? What are you thinking about? get uh, three runs, three attempts on course. They take your fastest on one course, add it to the fastest on the other. That ends up your total time for the national championships. Mm -hmm. And that format is run at uh, a lot of other solo, at Sports Car Club of America solo events uh, that, that we run. In fact, almost every regional event, uh, club event, that's pretty much how they, how they run. Mm -hmm. And my first run is pretty much a get to know you run. It's a handshake with a course. My second run, I'm looking to kind of figure out where can I kind of flirt with danger? How can I push things? How can I poke the tiger with a stick and is he going to bite me or is he going to sit there and purr a little bit before he nails, nails my butt? Mm -hmm. On the third run, if I'm behind, um, what I look at are the corners. I, I, I kind of break the course down. The corners that I'm doing well, the corners that I feel are actually working for me, that are flowing, that actually tie into parts of these course, I'll leave them alone. But there are usually two or three corners that I feel there's room for improvement. And those are the corners that I'll concentrate on. And that will, that actually can make or break uh, a national title. You're talking about being very analytical on something Extremely. that can take, I mean, we're talking about 30 seconds. and you know, you if you stand there on the sidelines and watch an autocross run, if if the person is doing it right, if the driver is good, it looks pretty anticlimactic. And it really does. But inside the car, there are a lot of things happening really quickly. How how long did it take you to get to the point where you could be that analytical in just the the millisecond that it takes to make those decisions? A lot of it came from experience and driving a lot of different cars. Each car I consider to be like I'm looking at a picture frame and you have the corners of the picture frame. And when you start painting the corners, as I call it, how does the car react? Um, I get asked by manufacturers and by people that have built cars, can you drive it and tell me what you think? And the first thing that I often look at is how does this car react when you start painting the corners? And that's what I try and um, look at. And, and I try and pretty much build cars with that in mind so that it gives you some room for error and you're not going to sit there and wad it out and wad it up and do a little ball if you happen to run out of talent on a corner or two. Um, a lot of it is driving a lot of different cars and understanding them. Also, I've got a, you know, I've got a, a degree in automotive technology I'm I'm an ASE master technician and I've worked with cars off and on more on than off. I probably have to say in the last 45 years. So understanding how they work is also key. You famously talk to your car while you're driving. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does that help? Sometimes. Well, <laughs> um, it depends. I can be kind of vocal inside the car. And, uh, you know, if I happen to make a mistake, lose a little bit of traction, get out in the marbles, you know, have a few minor little issues. To me, they're major. Uh, to somebody who's on looking, they probably never even see a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I've, I've been known to uh, throw a few F-bombs out there. And <laughs> uh, yeah, there's one famous sticker that's being floated around and, and I have a few left. Uh, but um, yeah. That that actually got mic'd. I didn't. I had totally forgotten that the, there was in the car. And yep, guilty. <laughs> <laughs> I think that every. I think if you mic'd every driver, there would be some of that. There would be. There would be. From uh, you know, when you put a camera on a driver, it's kind of funny. I, I had some folks ride with me uh, at Good Guys Autocross. And one gal, she just looked at my feet and she says, you have the fastest feet in history. And I've tried left foot braking. I got really good at it. Then I uh, went to just an autocross school and one of the best autocrossers in the entire universe, uh, Sam Strano, he said, why are you left foot braking? You don't need to be left foot braking. So I said, okay, fine. That makes it simple for me. I'll just go back to dancing the right foot around. And uh, she said, my God, you have got the fastest feet and uh, I, I never really realize it. I'm also making micro corrections with the steering wheel. 
Uh, that too has to do with setting up a car right. A lot of folks, they get these little tiny dinky ass steering wheels. They're like 13 inches in diameter. Mm -hmm. I'm going, how can you drive with this? Because you lose a lot of feel. I prefer a 15 inch wheel, no more, no less, because that's about the width of my shoulders. And I'm able to get that working position between 10 and two and eight and four. And I use kind of like a push pull. So my hands really never deviate from that working position. They can move around the steering wheel, but they're always in that position. And so uh, when I try and teach autocross and teach proper driving technique, I tell people uh, practice on the street because they'll, they'll get into a turn and, and they end up looking like a pretzel. Uh, their hands are all over the place. They're way past 12 and six because they haven't moved their hands on the wheel. When you don't move your hands on the wheel, you end up collapsing at the waist, you raise a hip, you're not centered in the seat. And that affects all of the activity behind the wheel of that car and also the ergonomics. You mentioned having driven uh -huh. a lot of cars and you mentioned, you know, you're talking about sort of setting up the car to be comfortable driving. Do you have mm -hmm. a favorite car of all of the cars that you've driven over the years? There was one car back in the 80s that I was honored to be able to be asked to drive, and that was Frank Stagnero's uh, Mustang. That car, it was a car that you basically wore like a glove. It mm -hmm. fits you well. He had it set up really well. It's changed a lot over the years, and he still campaigns the car. That was a, that was a particular favorite of mine to be able to drive. It did everything really well, very compliant. It didn't have any issues. Um, I mean, it was just a great car. And I tried when I got my Camaro built to model my car after a lot of what Frank's car had that I remembered back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I've done a really good job. That car is, a, is one that anybody can drive. Uh, you know, it basically does its job. It thinks it's a Miata. <laughs> it doesn't mm -hmm. realize it weighs 3,500 pounds and, you know, looks like the, you know, the Queen Mary per se, <laughs> but it really is a lot of fun. Mary's Orange 73 Camaro is probably the car she's most known for driving. Over the years, it's been fine-tuned into an impressive track car, but it wasn't always that way. When she first bought it 19 years ago, you couldn't just pull parts off the shelf to turn a second-gen Camaro into an autocross champion. Mary had a lot of hard work ahead of her. It's funny that you mentioned that Mustang. I thought for sure that the answer that you were going to give me was going to be your Camaro. Your Camaro is the fam your favorite car that, that you've ever driven. It's interesting to hear that that was sort of inspired by another car. Mm -hmm. For for people who aren't familiar, your Camaro is a 73, right? And it's it's LS powered, it's a manual transmission. It's a LS7, a Lingenfelter built the engine. They did a great job on that engine. Um, Tremec T T56 Magnum, uh, six speed. Mm -hmm. I can't find a more smoother, better precise shifting transmission out there for my needs. And then uh, we've had a lot of help with the car. We've had a lot of folks that have stepped up and said, you know, we really want to, want to, want to get our product on the car, uh, and you know, let's let's see if we can make some, you know, make things happen for you. Art Morrison designed the um, the independent rear suspension. We have Bayer brakes on the car. Ride Tech was huge as far as helping us with shocks and with other little bits and components. We had folks that helped, up with, uh, with, helped us with trim. That was Marquez. Um, gosh, it's, it's, there were just a ton of folks that really had, had their way and helped us with the car. Uh, Forge Line wheels, BF Goodrich tires. And it's kind of a sum of the parts. I call it a good car is pretty much the sum of the parts. Because back in the very beginning, when I got started with good guys um, and decided to start autocrossing the car, there was nothing for second gen Camaros. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing. Uh, I, I, I started on leaf springs, bought a set of leaf springs from a company called Global West. I inquired at other companies and they pretty much said, we have everything for a first gen, nothing mm -hmm. for a second gen. Sure. So we kind of decided to kind of go on it ourselves and everything. And now gradually the second gen has become a good, a good product for folks. Right. How long have you had that car? Well, uh, it's interesting you ask that because I bought the car in 2002 and we immediately stripped it down. It had a warmed over 350 with an automatic transmission, stock suspension, you know, really nothing much. Mm -hmm. um, and then we kind of put a, the ZZ383 crate engine in it, uh, got the Cat 5 springs 
from another company from, from uh, Global West, which are great springs, by the way. We put a set of shocks on and a sway bar, bought a little bits from here, little bits from there. Hotchkiss uh, provided some parts. And pretty much I just bought everything right off the shelf. And so uh, we ended up doing that with a car for a few years. What was really interesting was I ran the car. I basically got a set of wider wheels and tires and I threw a set of Hoosier or actually uh, Yokohama. Um, Yokohama? No, Kumo. The oh, okay. Kumo V710s. Uh, I went to a divisional. And I went there and uh, the divisional is what the tours are now. And I went there and it was like, okay, well, the car is in C prepared. So I ran C prepared ladies and it had been probably over, gosh, 15, 17 years since I'd last competed on an autocross track. And uh, I remember taking the car to that tour event and we had leaf springs on it. Basically I had a set of Kumo V710s on it. And that was the only thing that provided any any kind of stick on the car mm -hmm. but uh, I knew the car well and I remember sitting at the start line and we go by a sequence of numbers and uh, my competitor Mary Ankeny she ran over the very very first cone every cone counts if you hit it mm -hmm. I had a tour event and uh, so that was an automatic two second uh, you know penalty for her right off the bat and I remember sitting there thinking looking at that cone going okay Posey you were just given a gift what are you going to do with it? And I, like I talked earlier about looking at a course, fixing the corners that need to be fixing, leave the good stuff alone. And that's how I approached, uh, I ended up approaching that last run and I ended up winning the event, which when you look at that Camaro compared to what she was driving should never have happened. Well, a CP car is pretty serious. It's about, it's like the top fueler of SCCA autocross, right? Very much so. And then the, so the yeah, car then um, sort of slowly evolved after that. We got involved in good guys and that, you know, I, I really have to thank good guys for starting the autocross because back when it first started, I kind of came on the scene with good guys, two or threes, uh, maybe two or three years after uh, a, you know, a couple of manufacturers said, you know, Hey, come on, good guys. We, we have all these products and, you know, we want to see people get off the lawn chairs and get behind the wheel and drive their cars, you know, mm -hmm. show them, show us what they got. And we, we can, we, and we'll go ahead and help them. And that's what they did. And back in the very beginning of good guys, a good guys autocross, you had the same vendors that would sit there and just drive their cars around and give rides. Well, gradually people kind of went, you know, kind of fun. And they end up starting with that. Well, I came down to an, a good guys event down in Costa Mesa, California. I had I had a blast, and I think that was when the car first started getting some notice, and a lot of companies go, "Hey, this is kind of marketable." Mm -hmm. uh, had I had I been a guy, it probably wouldn't. I I would probably just be nothing. Uh, but that actually helped, and being personable and being willing to help other folks that kind of helped. So you talk about the beginning of autocross in the 70s, and it almost seems like it's kind of had a, a renaissance or a lot of people have really started paying attention to it. Do you think that's because Good Guys has sort of put that in front of so many people at their shows? Pretty much with Good Guys, um, I think they started their autocross a few years before, a couple of years before I actually went to my first event. And back then they just had a handful of cars and they were all owned by, you know, Ride Tech uh, and owned by DSE and a lot of the companies that had uh, started building product to get these cars to handle better. And gradually over a few years, a couple of years, and more people tried it and more people tried it. And they kind of, it's kind of become a huge event where they have to kind of shut off the entries because there's so many people. Mm -hmm. uh, and then SECA, of course, looked at that after a few years and went, you know, we can capture those folks and get them off their lawn chairs and behind the wheel of the cars. Let's have a class for the muscle cars. And the reason I, I, I think CAM has been such a, such a success is because the only place for these cars to run was either in CP and sometimes not even there, they had to run an E-modified, which you're going to get killed. I'll guarantee you. Uh, so it gave them a place where people could spend some money on their cars, spend some money on events, learn how to drive them and come out and play. And it worked out really well. And the cam class has grown at SCCA has grown exponentially as well. Oh, right? Huge, huge. Yes. Yes. Very much so. Um, I like it because I'd have to say most of these cars could easily be driven on the street. The few that come out where, you know, 
you're going, okay, race car, give, give it up. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I'd have to say 99, 98% of them could be driven on the street if the owner's elected to. Do you drive your car on the street? Well, it's funny you say that. I used to. I've sold the car. Your the car Camaro? has a new owner. You're I kidding. sold the Camaro. I know. Holy moly. I know. I sold it back in uh, December. A gentleman was interested in it, and he we talked a figure. He said, not a problem. And I said, okay. And uh, it was the point with, with, with COVID and with CAM, um, you know, and the price of getting to events price of tires, all this other good stuff. I just said, you know, it's time for somebody else to enjoy the car. I'm hmm. 65. I look at it and I go, it's my time to give back to the others that want to start. And, uh, it, you know, every autocross event was a couple hundred bucks. And to be competitive, you have to run. You can't just sit there and go to a handful of events a year and go to national and go, you know, there are no gimme trophies at nationals anymore. There used to be mm-hmm. not now. So uh, the car has a new owner. He wants to autocross it and he's really happy with it from what I understand. Wow. I know. I never thought I'd see that day come. And finally it was to the point I said, yeah, it's time. Wow. Isn't your Camaro in Gran Turismo, the video game? Am I making that yes, up? Yes, it is. It, no, you're not. Um, and that, that's actually a really funny story because we were invited to be part of the Hotchkiss booth at SEMA. Well, Alana Schur, who worked for their media, she worked for Con Media at the time Mm -hmm. and did all of their promotions and stuff. She says, you know, Mary, I nominated your car for Gran Turismo for for award. And I said, okay, whatever. She says, you're not going to win. You know, just, just, you know, they may, they may come by and look at the car and interview you. And I'm I'm thinking, I have no idea what Gran Turismo is. I'm not into (laughs) gaming or anything like that. Didn't have a clue. Well, anyway, we get to SEMA and the cars, the cars up on their little blocks and everything like that and people are coming by and alana says to me well they're going to come by and interview you and i said who and she says remember i told you about gran turismo and she says yeah i said okay so the guys there at the booth they're like wetting themselves they are because they all game they drive you know they 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 play forza they play gran turismo Mm -hmm. they play everything and it's you know they're, they're like going at it and so i said well what is this gran turismo i said mary you have you been on Mars? What? Yeah, come on, <laughs> get with it. And I said, hey, I'm an old broad. Give me, a, give me a break here. Well, so the guy, they actually have five different, um, different categories. And I was the hot rod category. And one of the guys came by and they have individual judges for each category. And they look at a smattering of cars. There's about 200, 250 cars each year that are nominated. And uh, so he says, okay, this is my pick. And he interviewed me. We talked about the car a little bit, talked to John Hotchkiss and, and uh, you know, Henry, um, who is his general manager and talked about the car and this and that, his products. And they said, okay, you're my pick for the hot rod. Didn't think anything about it. Now the creator of the game, Kazunori Yamashi, who actually is the creator of Gran Turismo. Wow. He's at the show. I'm still clueless from Mars. And um the guys are going, you have no idea who this is. He's coming to the booth. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah, and they're, they're, they're like going, going, going gobsmack over this. And I said, who is this guy? And he says, Mary, this is the guy. This is the guy. I mean, for God's sakes, you have no idea. He's Japanese, right? Yeah. How do you show respect for a Japanese dignitary? And they said, okay, well, this is what you do. You bow and you have your hands at your side. Or no, um, a woman, I think she bows with her hands over her groin. A man bows with hands to the side. So I got that part right. And uh, I met Kazanari Yamauchi and a wonderful gentleman. He was there with an interpreter and we Mm -hmm. went back and forth and back and forth. And they probably went out, oh gosh, maybe half an hour, 45 minutes. And the Hotchkiss guys are like, you know, salivating. Great group of guys. So anyway, um, he sits in the car and he says to the interpreter, this car I want to drive. And the car was up on, on blocks, uh, stands, because they wanted to show off the undercarriage. Mm-hmm. They had a new three-link suspension that they had designed, and they wanted people to be able to see it without crawling under a car. They wanted to get the car up in the air. So he had to step up and get on the car, and, and he sat there. And because he and I are about the same height, everything fit him. It wasn't mm-hmm. like he's having to adjust anything. I'm about 5'7" uh with about a 31 30 31 and a half inch inseam he was pretty much the same thing so the car fit him like it does me like a glove mm-hmm. 
And there's a big party that night at the Cosmopolitan. So I have something in common with uh, Kim Kardashian. We both had a big celebration there. She had her <laughs> birthday party. Um, so we get there and there's a herd of people at the Cosmopolitan. And I'm like, well, I don't know who to go see. I don't know who's, and this woman grabs me and she says, you're late, get in here. And she drags me in there. I'm like, okay, well, what about the people that I've got with me? And, and, uh, and so she says, don't worry, they're, they're going to get in. So we all get in and there's, there's, there's five of us, five finalists. And mm -hmm. I, you know, nobody knows who Kazunori is, uh, you know, uh, Yamashi-san is going to be, is going to be choosing. Well, the clue I had was that he had come by after the show was over. I had gone home to get ready for this big party and everything. Mm -hmm. And he had, he had taken a lot more pictures with the car and he had sat in it again. And he'd looked over it and he'd, you know, poked and prodded and everything. I didn't realize this, but the, the Hotchkiss guys told me because they were still there. Well, so they show all of it. We get to go up and get a, each individual award for winning our respective finalist class. And then he says, my pick for this year is the 1971. And I just sat there because it's like my car's a 73. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this is because at Good Guys, if you had it, the, the cutoff was 72. Mm -hmm. So okay, because the car was a 73, I said, and Good Guys told me this, is said, hey, Mary, we want you to run. Just say it's a 71 or 72 because they all look alike anyway. They've said mm -hmm. change this rule, but back at the time, uh, they were pretty, pretty solid about it. So I then said, okay, it's a 71. And then one of the guys turns to me and we're in this little secluded area. And he says, uh, you want your cars up there? And I said, what? And he says, yeah. So I went up there and, and we are now in Gran Turismo 6 and on. Um, there it is. People uh, buy the car and they have it priced at seven hundred and fifty thousand oh, dollars. Wow. I cannot even afford my own car. <laughs> and I own I own the damn thing. You know, I can't even afford my own car to race it. Um, what's also funny is that Mark Stilo, who we call him the godfather of pro touring. He's a mm -hmm. GM engineer, a great guy. His uh, one of his cars that he had he had actually built was selected two or three years before. So he's always been telling me, okay, Mira, I'm, 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 I'm going to put you into the wall. And we, we go back and forth and joking around this and that, but it's kind of, kind of funny, but uh, people that have the car and have, have driven it, they said, it's really good. The imaging process is amazing. What they have you do to get that car included in the game. You have to, well, I brought it down to Spectra uh, down in Southern California. We put it on the dyno. Um, they, they, they put microphones anywhere. They digitize the car, oh, wow. uh, which is like having an MRI done on your car. <laughs> um, interviewed me. I mean, it's, I, I had to provide all sorts of God, calculations and adjustments. I had no idea half this stuff even existed. Um, okay, if you want this, I'll go ahead and do it. And I calculated the best I could. But uh, yeah, people, people love it. They say it's probably one of the best handling and best driving cars they have on Gran Turismo for what it is. So that's kind of cool. Have you played the game? Have you driven your own car on the game? No, I haven't. <laughs> I still haven't played the game. I know. <laughs> I'm so pathetic. <laughs> well, I mean, when crazy. you can, when you I, can yeah. go out and drive the real thing I, around a racetrack, you don't really need to right. do yeah. <laughs> And it was always one of those things, Lee and I really need to get there and drive, drive the car, drive the car, drive the car. I still have not driven the car. It's, well, this year, it'll be 11 years. I mean, 10, uh, 10 years since the car was included in the game. I know, <laughs> 10 years. Time flies. I never thought that would ever happen. But that car has really opened so many doors for me and, and created a lot of fun. It mm -hmm. really is a ton of fun. In just a minute, Mary talks about her time behind the wheel of the Speedway Motor 70 Camaro. But first, to see pictures of Mary and her Camaro, visit the Toolbox, our automotive blog. Find it at speedwaymotors.com by clicking the Toolbox link on the front page. We'll also post a few shots to Facebook and Instagram. New episodes of What Moves You come out every two weeks on Tuesdays. If you like what you hear, tell a friend to listen to What Moves You on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you go to get your favorite podcasts. So your car was a 73 Camaro. You mm -hmm. have spent some time behind the wheel of the Team Speedway and Speedway Motors yes. 70 Camaro. And yes, we did that. You know, we we wanted to compete in Good Guys Autocross to sort of show yeah. off suspension and stuff. So so mm -hmm. we built that car. 
is there, can you compare the two? Because they're pretty different cars. They're, they're, they're completely different cars. Um, I don't would have to say that uh, Al's car, uh, the 70 Camaro, it's, it's like a light switch with a clutch. Uh, it's, you're either in, 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 in your happy place or it's sitting there biting you in the ass. Um, both cars are really fun to drive once they get going. Al likes his cars low and he likes them with not a lot of suspension travel. I like a hard to have a lot of suspension travel because I like to be able to let the car have a chance to uh, fix itself in a corner if it can. And Al, Al has that knack driving Indy cars and driving, driving the open wheel stuff for so many years of be able to make those instantaneous corrections me, not so much. I like to have the car kind of help me out a little bit. So whenever I would drive the car, I'd have them make all these changes. One was to the steering wheel. And uh, and then they I'll drive and he'd change it all back. And then I'd, I'd drive it and I'd change it all back to me and he'd change it back to him. But we all it got to be kind of like a running joke with um, with uh, you know the guys and everything that were working and bringing the car to, to, to events. So we have the Mary set up and we have the Al set up. And then we have the Robbie set up. And... Uh, Robbie's one of those that can get in anything. He could probably drive, you know, a shopping cart around good guys and win. He's got so much natural talent. Al does too. Um, but it was an honor to be able to be asked to drive that car. And it was, it was really a good car. Uh, they're, they're both good cars. They both do their jobs really, really well. Uh, they're similar in many respects and they're different in many respects. The IRS in my car, I think makes it a little more compliant and um, it just, you know, it, there are many ways to skin a cat. And I think with Speedway Motors that they've actually done a really good job with that car, getting it to where it is and getting it so that pretty much anybody can drive it. Well, you, we've sort of approached this a couple of times. You have a lifetime of experience autocrossing. Mm -hmm. And because this is now so visible and it's at good guys and people are seeing it and the cam class has made it so that you can drag your... Camaro out of the garage and run it. There are a lot yep. of newbies and a lot of first timers out there. If you were going to give some advice to, to somebody who's just starting out, what would it be? What I would say is work a year on how to properly drive an autocross course. Learn, take schools, take classes. Almost every solo community in any part of the country offers driving classes. Seek the advice from those that are at the events that you value their opinion, have them ride along with you. Um, listen to what they have to say, have them coach you. A good coach is invaluable. I would also recommend that they start off the first year not driving so much their cam car if they wanna do that, but to drive in what we call the street class. Street used to be stock. And you want to drive on a set of good 200 treadwear tires, but you want to drive on something that is forgiving and spend a year driving in a class, uh, maybe your daily driver, if it's classed appropriately, or go out and buy something that, uh, you know, would be uh, appropriate. Uh, Mazda Miatas are so popular because you can't kill one. They're cheap to run. You can buy a set of extra wheels and tires for one, swap them at the event. And you're pretty much good to go. And they teach you a lot. They don't have a lot of power that's going to go ahead and bite you and kill you. Uh, but they're, they're really fun. And they hold, hold their value when you get done with the learning experience, sell it to somebody else, and you're good to go. Then start in earnest with your pro touring car, your cam car. And work on the suspension first. Everybody goes Godzilla with the engine. And the poor car doesn't stand a chance of getting around a corner. So work with a suspension first, work with wheels and tires first, get a set of second tires and wheels that you can take to an event or just drive to the event. And again, learn from folks that have been around the block several times with this class and hopefully you'll learn some. Uh, try and get uh, coaching from different drivers. You'll always pick up some tidbits from folks and some you can use, some you may not be able to use, but uh, you know, spend time behind the wheel. Seat time is valuable and really, really work on that. Don't just sit there and throw dollars at the car because granted they will stick, but doesn't necessarily make, make you uh, faster. What you're describing is so contrary to every sort of gearhead instinct that 
says, I want to go faster. So I need a bigger cam and I need bigger tires and I need bigger sway bars. What, what you're describing yeah. is to modify the driver instead of modifying the car. The driver mod is absolutely huge. A uh, very good autocrosser, probably one of the best in the world is Andy Hollis. And he said, the hands follow the eyes and the car follows the hands. So you have to look where you're going. You have to look through a corner. You have to make micro corrections based on what those four corners and grip levels are telling you. And this has to be done instantaneously. You don't have, you don't have time to go, oh, gee, the front end is pushing. Well, maybe I should take some angle out of the steering wheel and... Oh, by that time, you're going to be in Milwaukee. So you have to make these micro corrections uh, really, really fast. Biggest, uh, biggest thing that I see a lot of newcomers do or folks that get behind the wheel of these cars, they go into a corner way too fast, crank the wheel, and the poor car doesn't stand a chance and the car starts to understeer. Well, then what do they do? They add more steering angle to it rather than taking angle out. Front wheels like to turn and roll. They don't like to be scrubbed sideways. You lose, you lose traction, you lose grip. So if you can go ahead and realize what's happening right off the bat, take a little bit of angle out. And we're not talking a lot, a few degrees, maybe all that's necessary. Get that front tire, get those front tires to be able to go, oh yeah, there's a corner, we need to get around it. And I think that helps the driver and the car start working together as a team. I've heard you talk before about sort of the phases of driver evolution from, from newbie to okay. seasoned professional. What, what are those sure. in your opinion? I call it, there's four levels of driving and a lot of folks are going to disagree with me. They may have 10, they may have two, they may have whatever. For me, it's four. The first is basically you get out there and you're trying to figure out what to do. You're trying to stay on course. You're trying to figure out where the course goes. Uh, you react when you get to a corner. You don't plan on what you're going to do before that corner and how you're going to come out of it. The second phase is you start kind of figuring out how an autocross is. You build up a little bit of speed. You're not as afraid of the throttle as you used to be. Um, you're harder on the throttle. You're harder on the brakes. You're not that much afraid to slide the car a little bit and work it around a corner, but you're still not fast. You're still a couple seconds behind the quote, fast guys. Third phase, you're wild. You're absolutely over the top. You're overdriving almost everywhere. You're uh, looping the car often. You make major mistakes. And this is something that I'd have to say a lot of good autocrossers have to go through because you have to know where those limits are before you can bring yourself back. If you're always just kind of going, well, I'm going to go into a corner and God, I hope the car doesn't spin out, doesn't spin out, doesn't spin out you're pretty much limited by your fear and your trepidation and thinking, well, what if? Good drivers will go to set stage four, level four. And this is where you know where those levels are, you know where the limits are, and now you are figuring out how to drive, as I call it, analytically. You used that term before, and it really is true. You look at each autocross course as an individual entity because you'll never see that course again for the most part. They change every weekend. It's not like Indy where Indy is Indy. Road America is Road America. They're not going to sit there and change the track on you. <laughs> you're going to be having the same corner now as you're going to be having 10 years from now. Never will happen in an autocross, which is why we're given a chance to walk the courses. And when you walk a course, you look at it very analytically. You, sometimes I will go ahead and kneel down so I can see it from my driver's level. I'm mentally looking at what am I going to do in this corner? How am I going to present the car in the corner? Not necessarily, where should I start braking? And everybody asks me, where do I need to start braking? Where do I need to pick up the power? And I go, you're going to feel it in what I call the butt dyno. And uh, the butt dyno is basically your gluteus maximus sitting in the seat. And it basically oh. signals your brain to go ahead and go, okay, right foot. Let's start, uh, let, let's start, let's start having something fun happen now. And so that fourth level is where you start putting all of these things together. Unfortunately, I see a lot of folks that never make it out of level two or three. They're gonna have fun, they're gonna enjoy themselves, but they're gonna abuse a lot of cars and abuse a lot of tires getting to that point. And when I see drivers sitting there sliding around corners unnecessarily and really sit coming down hard on the cars, I go, you know, you're not going forward. 
and uh, a really good autocrosser, Danny Pop, uh, he is excellent. Mm -hmm. um, he said, always forward, rarely straight. I call it rarely forward, rarely straight, because you're always taking a bending line. One of the things that I used to do when I was a kid was I showed uh, horses and I showed jumpers and, and you're always planning for that next fence. You're planning on how you can you approach that next fence so you get the takeoff proper and the horse is not going to be able to hit the fence or get, get, get inside or under the fence or take off too long. And we call that a bending line. It's the same thing with autocrossing. You're taking bending lines everywhere. Nothing is ever, ever straight. You can have a quarter mile straight. And I'll guarantee you, it is never 100% a linear line. You are a darn good driver. I've seen it. I've seen you kick butt on the ringers that we've brought in to drive our, you know, pro-built cars. Did, <laughs> were you ever tempted to branch out and do something other than just, uh, just autocrossing? Or did you? Well, um, the best thing that we've had come for the pro touring, if you want to get out of just solo and autocross, is the Ultimate Streetcar uh, series mm -hmm. and uh, Optima Batteries, uh, FM3. They basically put on a really good show with that, and you get to go to racetracks. It's by kind of like a uh, three-day eventing, if you want to bring it back to the horse sightings. Uh, where you have um, an autocross, you have a speed stop, you've got a uh, brake braking challenge, and then um, you do a, you have to do a rudimentary drive on the street to show the car can make it. Mm -hmm. And then you also get to drive the cars on dedicated racetracks, which is kind of a cool thing. And so, um, but all, uh, USCA has really has been invaluable, and that's actually helped a lot of people get out there too. It takes a lot of money. It's not cheap. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it, you know, of course, we all have these dreams of doing wheel to wheel road racing. My husband has a Lola T70 Can-Am car oh, wow. that he does vintage racing with. He bought the car for $600 out of an Auto Week ad in 74. Oh, man. And he has researched the history. Oh, yeah. The car ran in the USRC, ran at Bridgehampton, ran at Nassau Speed Week. And basically a guy got it and he went to driver school in it, ripped a corner off of it and the car sat. He ended up buying it and he has done, he originally was going to build an autocross car out of it. But what I look at today to keep that car running, a set of tires is easily two grand mm -hmm. and you have entry fees of a thousand dollars. You have, um, we live close to Laguna Seca. So when we run there, it's not a big problem. We can sleep in our own bed, but you for like car week here, when you have, um, you know, the Monterey Historics or the, the Monterey Reunion, as they now call it, you know, hotel rooms go for $500, $600 a night, if not more. Yeah. So it's not, it's not a, it's not, it, it is a richer man sport. And I looked at autocross and I said, I can autocross an entire season, possibly two for what a couple of race weekends would cost me. I did the math, autocross one, the chance of, of, of stacking up your car at an autocross, very, very low percentage of that. In a racetrack, and and you've got to be pretty much prepared to write the thing off every time you hit the track. I like I've, my cars too much. I I've don't want heard to do it that. said that you should never race anything that you can't afford to push off a cliff. And I think that there's a lot of truth to that. It's true. And yeah. and while while I have seen some sort of gnarly crashes at the autocross into the jersey barriers for the most part oh, that's yeah. right and i think that that's part of yeah. the appeal of it is that you can go out with your nice paint shiny pro touring car and run with a fairly low risk of as you said piling it up into the wall or it is fairly low risk yes very i mean i i'm not going to say i haven't seen it happen but uh i can probably count on one hand in the 45 years of autocrossing uh mishaps where you know cars got damaged mm -hmm. people got hit whatever yeah corner workers very 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 small percentage so economics aside you are in the mm -hmm. rare position that not a lot of people are to have made laps at speed on say laguna seca or or a famous yeah. road course and then obviously mm -hmm. made a lot of laps around an autocross how do how did the two compare how do you have to approach uh each of those on a racetrack, if you fluff up a corner, you have another option. You have another chance to fix it the next lap. Mm -hmm. On an autocross course, like I mentioned before, that course, you're never going to see it again. So if you're on your third run and uh, or, you know, your last run and you end up having an issue, that's it. 
that's interesting. So you have to you have to look at things, yeah. And also the speeds are higher for the most part on a dedicated racetrack. Um, they have runoff, which in autocross uh, you have a little bit of runoff room, but uh, you know in racetracks it's it's a little bit it's a little bit more in some areas. The problem with racetrack is that uh, with actually uh, track track driving is that there are areas where you can really get into trouble and you are going to damage a car if you go off course mm -hmm. or you end up hitting hitting something uh, fixed. And there's a lot of fixed objects out there on a racetrack that you really don't see at your conventional SCCA solo event. Another thing that has, you know, every form of motorsport and really every sort of car culture has has its own culture and it has, you know, groups and, and people that are, are friends because of it. One thing that's really impressed me about autocross and especially SCCA, you know, we host the solo nationals here in Lincoln every year. And it just seems like it's a big yep. family. And it almost seems like the it solo is. nationals every year are like a family reunion. You have friendships that have been around, gosh, for over 40 years. Mm -hmm. I think the first nationals were in mid 70s, 75, 74, 75, if my memory strikes me. Okay. And um, we have what's called the 100 percenters and it's getting smaller and smaller every year. People are passing on, people can't go to events or whatever. But uh, I think there's maybe five or six people that have gone to every single inception of the oh, national wow. championships. Uh, but we go there, we call it, we come for the cars, we stay for the people. Another friend of mine mentioned that phrase. And um, it, it really hits home because people are so willing to help others. If somebody's cars break, here, drive mine. Here, mm -hmm. let's get it over to the trailer. Let's see if we can fix what you've got. Speedway Motors fixed my Camaro before we ran the national championships in 2015. And we had to do some welding. We had to do some tire clearance. We had to fix a half shaft. Oh my God. It was like, bring the car over. We'll get it up on jack stands. I was like, oh my God. I, you know, I was thinking my event was over. Um, I knew what I had to do, but there were some things that I could not fix with what I have on my enclosed trailer. They got it done for me. And, uh, you know, I had so many people coming by. What's wrong with the car? Are you okay? Is the car okay? Do you need another car to drive? You know, it, where, where else would you find that in any form of motorsport? Right. It, you just wouldn't. It, it is amazing. Yeah. I have, in my limited experience with autocross, never encountered somebody who would who refused to help. And that is mm -hmm. rare in any type of competition. Autocrossing is only about six minutes at mm -hmm. nationals. You're only, you know, you're there for two days, probably closer to four by the time you, you know, you're there and you go to all the get togethers and this and that and hang out with your friends for six minutes of behind the wheel driving. Mm -hmm. It's like, really? Uh the, and, but we do it because it's such a social event addition to six minutes of fury behind the wheel. Right. And, um, you know, we, we have a lot of fun with it. And I mean, I've made, I've made so many friends with the sport. It's been wonderful. It really has been. Mary really has been there and done that. She's been a fixture in autocross for longer than some of her competitors have even been alive. And while I was shocked to hear that she sold her Camaro, it turns out Mary isn't done with cars just yet. So what comes next for you? I, I mean, I'm shocked to hear that you, that there won't be an orange Camaro anymore. <laughs> what comes well, next? Well, there might be. It just won't be me behind the wheel of okay. it. Um, I mean, unless the guy decides, the guy that bought it says, hey, we'd love to have you drive the car. But, you know, he's, uh, he's, 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 uh, he's very beginner at it. And I really hope that he does continue with it because it's a good car. He's basically got a ready-made entity. Mm -hmm. and um, the car really doesn't need anything. I may be a fresh set of tires, but that's about it. Uh, well, when I get into something, I get into it hook, line, and sinker. The latest thing is motorcycling. At an age late 63, I was almost 64. I got a wild hair at my butt, and I actually have to blame, um, I have to blame you guys for it, in a sense, because I, I, oh, no. my husband and I were on our way down Oh, yeah. No, this is really funny. My husband and I were on our way down to drive, uh, you know, the Johnny Lightning, the 1970 Camaro that you guys have down at Fontana at California Speedway mm -hmm. for the Super Chevy shootout. Right. 
And on the way down, Dave and I are talking, and oh yeah, well, you know, maybe I'll get another, I'll, I'll buy another motorcycle. You know, I have this little Honda XL175 and I've ridden it on the street and it really struggles. And I feel like I'm gonna be run over by everybody. And, <laughs> you know, yeah, I'd like to get something, maybe like a 300, you know, and I'm going, I'm listening to this. And he always talks about, well, I could go here and I could go there. And so he started looking at bikes and I went to my MSF, Motorcycle Safety Foundation School and rode and passed and uh i bought a honda rebel 500 bbs out, out, out grew that now i've got three motorcycles that i ride <laughs> and uh probably have over fifteen thousand miles of seat time on a motorcycle have no ambitions to get a get a crotch rocket right um you know to get anything like 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 that um they're all kind of um uh, they're all pretty much just standards uh, for motorcycles. And I have an adventure bike, the BMW, but it has opened up a whole new world for me. And I really do enjoy it. I ride very conservatively. I ride fun. It's fast. It's neat. And it's great to be able to experience um, places that we have around here in Monterey County uh, from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's kind of cool. And my husband bought a bike and uh, so we, we do it together. You mentioned that you're working at a museum a motorcycle museum as well oh yeah this is motor talbot uh the motor talbot collection and it's rob talbot you know are you familiar with signs um they're a local they're a local winery here uh monterey peninsula monterey county and um rob has always had this great dream of building a motorcycle museum and so he sold the winery and that gave him the funding to be able to develop uh, the museum. And he, we probably have over 180 motorcycles and two wheel, we have bicycles, a lot of really cool stuff there. It's in Carmel Valley Village. And um, if you're inside, you know, if you're excited for motorcycles or anything, even cars, I mean, it really is, is cool. We have stuff from pre-war, we have old stuff, new stuff, racing stuff, uh, just obscure things. Um, every time I go there, I learn, I learn a lot. So I became a docent there, one of the, uh, one of the folks that show people around and uh, there to help, you know, explain what we're about and, and the motorcycles that, that, that they're seeing. And it's been a ton of fun. Rob's great to work with, got other docents that are great to work with. And uh, being retired, I never thought I'd look at getting another job, but uh, yeah. So are you, are you done with cars? No. Um, well, you know, what's really interesting is par par partial payment uh, for the Camaro, the guy, I, I was looking for a C6 Grand Sport, Corvette mm -hmm. C6 Grand Sport. Mm -hmm. He says, well, I've got a, I've got a C6 Z06 and the heads have been done. Heads are a known problem in the, you know, with, with that car. Heads have been done. And would you be willing to take it as partial trade? I'd be, it'd go easier on my wife if I could just change car for car rather than come mm -hmm. up with a new car and still have this one. And so he threw out a number and I said, sure. So I now have a 2009, really beautiful uh, C6 Z06 and um, waiting for a set of uh, set of tires for it. Uh, with COVID, our events still are not back to normal here. We have limit of 50 to 75 people, depending upon where we run. And so it's one of these things where um, in time, I'll probably get back out and campaign that car. I think it'd be a lot of fun. So I'm not out of it 100%, but um, I'm not, you know, unless I have a really cool car to drive at nationals, um, I probably won't, uh, you know, schlep a car back from here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to run cam one more time, but not having a car, I don't know if that'll ever happen. But yeah, that'd be good. I, I'm always interested in sort of part of the pro touring thing is making a big archaic old muscle car sort of handle like a new Corvette. And so now that you have done both, w which one do you like better? Mm -hmm. Oh, the Camaro, hands down. Uh, but I also like the Corvette, hands down. It depends mm -hmm. upon what I'm asking the car to do. The, Cor the Camaro, God, how do I put this? The Camaro gives you a lot of communication. So mm -hmm. when you are into a corner, you can lean that car over and it gives you so much feedback as to what's going to happen. It's like, okay, I'm going to come around on you on Tuesday and today's Sunday. You know, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's so compliant and so easy to drive and so fast. It really is fun. The Corvette is numb in many ways because you have rubber bushings uh, in, in the A street class. Uh, you can't change a lot of the things that, 
you look at firsthand to change mm -hmm. right off the bat to change in uh, you know in cam so we kind of have to drive what we have we can change one sway bar which in the corvette would be the front we mm -hmm. can wheels have to be the same size same same offset um and you can change tires to any 200 tread wear you want and shocks are pretty much free uh, for the most part mm -hmm. that's it so you have to start off with a really good platform and the corvette has been a winner in many many years for a street uh super street you know and in, in a lot of the classes where it's eligible to run mm -hmm. so yeah i'll go ahead and run that car a little bit here on the west coast It'd be kind of fun good chance to see people well i'm happy to hear that you i, I was afraid that this was going to end with you saying sorry i'm done with cars you know i'm, I'm happy to hear that you're no, 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 no. I, I don't think that'll ever happen. Um, I may not be jumping into the deep end of the pool like I used to be, but uh, yeah, I'll still be there. I'll still be there. I've really enjoyed, you know, driving for Speedway Motors and Team Speedway and, and uh, you know, the folks that are part of that whole, whole business. Um, that's been one of the highlights of my, you know, my life with cars. And, uh, you know, I, it's just, I can't think of too many negatives that have happened with that Camaro and the events that I've competed at. Uh, you know, nothing. It's all been positives. It's all been it's all been very rewarding. Thanks to Mary Posey for being our guest today, and thanks to all of you for listening to What Moves You, a Speedway Motors podcast. To see photos and watch video we referenced in today's episode, visit the toolbox at speedwaymotors.com. Email the podcast at podcast at speedwaymotors.com. And if you like what you heard, tell a friend where to find us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in two weeks.